So is everyone full and sleepy? Yes. <laughs> Before we do that, I just wanted to check to see if anybody has anything, any questions or, or comments related to what we were talking about this morning that they wanted to bring up before we move on to the meditation. Yes? One of the thoughts that I wasn't clear about is when you were talking about meditating and labeling the thoughts that went through our minds, if they were images, or thoughts, or thinking, or talking, and you said it's helpful to label which ones are the distractions. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. And then I missed something because you tied it to thoughts and something on emotions, and then you said if that keeps coming up, then they could be very well be connected. And I missed whatever whatever uh, point you were really making, and I wondered if it were all possible for you to backtrack. Okay, well, let's see if we can backtrack to that. <clears throat> the labeling I was talking about is actually uh, the mindfulness practice that uh, that uh, Shinzen Young teaches, and the mindfulness practice similar but related mindfulness practice that I uh, teach at Spirit Rock and INS. It's called the Mahasi Method. Okay. And both of these are practices that involve labeling. And uh, Shinzen divides things up into these different uh, areas. You know, so you have, in terms of what's going on in your mind, introspective awareness, you know, there's of course, images that arise and there's the talk. These are the two main ones, and they're easy to focus on. Mm -hmm. and, and then there are uh, sensations in the body that are also mental in origin in the sense that they're related to emotions. And so the practice he teaches involves recognizing those when they're present and labeling them. So what this is doing is training you to have introspective awareness mm -hmm. because to label them you have to know that they're there you have to remember that's what it is that you're supposed to be doing and then you have to generate the appropriate label the Mahasi style mindfulness practice is similar in many ways and, and actually Shinzen developed his as, as a, kind of a variation on that what the meditator does there is they anchor their attention to the rise and fall of the abdomen and then whenever something comes along that grabs their, well, I shouldn't say, if something comes along that grabs their attention, they label it. But also anything that appears in peripheral awareness that is strong, that stands out from the rest. That, from the rest. And what they do is they shift their attention to it and label it. So if they start thinking, they say thinking, thinking. Or if there's a sound outside that is to strong and drawing their, their attention, they'd say hearing, hearing. So this is doing the same thing. It's training you to be uh, introspectively aware of what's going on in your mind. So I, know, so I was talking about that. I hope that clarified that. Yes. And then the other, where, where did your question go? There was something that made me think, something that you said that made me think we were connecting thoughts that came up, or conversations, or situations, oh, yes. with some un, un emotion, and I, in my mind I made it unpleasant, I made it a debris, something that really you could look at, sort out, and eliminate from life. <laughs> okay, yes, that, well that is what happens. If you're doing this practice, uh, and this is really one of the things that, that Shinzen really wants you to experience, is thoughts come up and 
you are forced to be aware of those thoughts and say thinking, thinking, or if they're images, you say that those are images, image. Uh, and then if emotions are arising as well, so, so this is three different domains here that you can work with, feeling, image, talk. I choose them because they're introspective. He also uses the extrospective domains, but feeling, image, talk, okay? If you practice observing in those three domains, after a while you're going to notice the relationship between the thoughts or the images and the feelings. And you'll see how they interact with each other and reinforce each other, and there comes a thought, and the thought leads to a feeling, and the feeling leads to more thoughts, which make the same feelings even stronger, or sometimes lead into a different kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, annoyance may transform into something else based on the thoughts that came up. Right? That, that's perfect. Yeah. So the result of that, the result of doing this practice is, is a very, very valuable experience of seeing how <clears throat> how essentially how different parts of your mind are interacting with each other and creating mental states and and you can get carried away by those mental states. When you understand how this happens, you know, and this is what Shenzhen calls the divide and conquer aspect, you know, you realize that the thoughts are just the thoughts and the feelings are just the feelings. And if you can see them that way, then they don't start adding together and mounting into this huge complex that's hard to get get your mind around. You're just the victim of it. And a lot of the ones that I was thinking of, that I was, the reason I asked is because some of those cause suffering. Yeah. And they, they haunt people. And they might be little things, yeah. if, or they might be big things you can never change. Yes. But they cause suffering on the left. So, and when you're very quiet, sometimes they percolate to the top. And it's exactly. a good opportunity to start dismantling. That's exactly right. When your mind becomes quiet, all that stuff down there that you never are aware of when your mind is busy, it starts to come to the surface and you start to see it. And that, that is one of that, that that's one of the ways that that Meditation and mindfulness work such a powerful therapeutic effect. It brings about a purification of your mind. As you've accumulated a lot of stuff that hasn't been resolved. Well, maybe not you. meditating and focusing on an object and a thought starts to form but you, there's no particular feeling so no strong feeling associated with it and it seems like a distraction is it better to just let go of it before the thought even maybe it has formed or is it better to wait until the thought forms to see what it is Okay, that's a very good question. The question is, if a thought starts to form, is it better to wait and see what it is, or just dis what would, did you use the word disregard? Just let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Okay. And the answer is, to the degree that your mind has grasped onto it, let it go. But don't try to make it come, uh, go away. The, the three, three, three things to keep in mind. Let it come. Let absolutely anything come that wants to come. Let it come. Let it be. Don't hold on to it. Don't do anything with it. Just let it be there. As long as it wants to be there, however it wants to be there. If no one is ready to go, let it go. Don't chase after it. Or, yeah. so let it come, let it be, let it go. That applies most of the time. Every now and then, what will happen is something will come, you'll let it be, you'll let go of it if your mind has grabbed onto it, and let it be. 
And then instead of it going, it just keeps on mounting in intensity, significance, starts to bring some emotional weight with it and things like that. When it becomes, when that thought or that emotion becomes strong enough that you can't just let it be, that's the time to direct your attention at it or towards it. And then that allows mindfulness to begin <coughs> performing the purification process that it, it, it can carry out with regard to this thing. But the only way that you, you have to let these things tell you whether they're the things to just leave them alone, ignore them, or whether they, they need you to apply mindfulness to them. And they tell you if, if, if they want if they want a dose of mindfulness, they'll keep knocking on the door. They'll keep drawing your attention towards them. They'll become more and more intense and more and more difficult to disregard. As long as you can just disregard it, let it be there, and just go back to your practice, that's what you should do. But then as soon as you realize something's different, then you can focus on it. Good question. We were having a discussion, uh, three of us, about intention and forcing. And about the, intention. intention uh, and forcing. Yes. And um, the intention in meditation uh, to, 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 to do something and, and, uh, rather than forcing it. And we were wondering whether or not you don't have to really do anything at all. You just have the intention in meditation. And if that's the case, then um, could that also be transferred to, to, to life? outside meditation or outside the cushion. For example, a meeting, a community meeting where you may not usually get, sometimes there's a lot of people, you don't get to speak. And rather than force your voice on everybody, if you just have the intention to say what you want to say, could you just leave it at that and, and trust that at some stage the opening will come up, maybe this meeting or the next meeting? Oh. <laughs> well, in that example, there's some factors that aren't under control, and of course, it's going to depend on the significance of what you want to bring up. You know, right? If, if it's the fact that there's a fire in the stairwell, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. But uh, the the thing is, if you what happens to us is. In a, in a meeting, for example, you might have some thought comes in, and this is really important, and I, I really want to tell this, but just about that time, the topic of discussion has shifted to something else. <coughs> and it's, well, do I burst in and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, we, you've got to hear this important thing I have to say. Um, you can you can hold that in mind and wait for, if you have the intention to tell them, you can wait for a suitable opportunity uh, and you can create a suitable opportunity. For your intention? Yeah. If you have, if, if you have, an, if you have a really strong intention to say something, yeah. um, then when an opportunity arises, you'll, you'll do it. Or if, um, if the opportunity doesn't arise, but you see an opening, at some point you'll realize, well, I'd better jump in the first opening here. Right. We were thinking that maybe some things uh, are going to happen more naturally through intention. <coughs> so for example, if the, if the results that you want, you are hoping to, to see happen are in line with reality and are beneficial to others and maybe calming to the mind or calming to others, yeah. then that, they will stand on two legs and then they will be more likely to be successful through your intention than, say, some kind of damaging intention company. Uh, on the well, yeah. <laughs> so positive, so we can trust in the fact that in our meditations or in our lives, if we're trying to do something positive, and we have the intention, that we can maybe rely a lot on the intention, maybe even totally, but certainly a lot on the intention, and do away with a lot of the pushing. Trust that, that, that our... The results will happen because of our good intentions. I, I, I think you could reasonably say that. Uh, what you're going to find is that 
it's very important to be clear on your intention. And that doesn't come automatically or necessarily easily. And sometimes you think your intention is, you know, so-and-so really needs to hear this. Yeah. It's for their own good. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there's, there's an infinite number of ways that it can seem like you, you want to do something out of one intention. But if you examine it more closely, which you have the opportunity to do if you don't leap right in there, is you realize that there's, there's really a different intention underneath. And this is, this, is, this is one of the things you want to do. And this is one of the things that comes from mindfulness. If you practice being mindful, you start more and more often having the experience of you think you want to do or say something for one reason, but by the time you are ready to do it, you're already realizing there's some other reason there. And then it, it, may, it, may be, it, it may be an even better reason to go ahead, but then again, it may be a good reason to hold back. So the clearer your intentions are, and the less internal conflict there is behind them, the easier it is going to be for them to manifest. And the, the more natural and spontaneous it's going, to, it's going to appear to be. Um, very often, if you have an intention that's not clear, it, what it means is that there are some other intentions, some of which are conflicting. Whereas, if your intention is really clear, in other words, if everybody in here is all convinced that this is the right thing to do, then everybody in here is going to be trying to make sure that that thing gets done. And so it's far more likely to happen, it'll happen much more easily, it'll seem to happen much more naturally, gracefully. Yeah, thank you. But I, I wonder, though, as I hear this little part of the discussion, if, if, if what, it, it sounds kind of close to the secret, you know, like if you form an intention and you get, <laughs> real, you, know, you get really clear about it, you know, it's like it'll manifest in your life. Well, I take a, a, a bit of an issue with that whole angle myself. Well, actually, <laughs> these two things, yeah. it's, there it's is, very close. there is a truth behind the secret. That's the, I mean, it, it, that's yeah. part of why I mean, a lot of good salesmanship and stuff like that. But that, but the fact that there is some validity. There's a nugget in there. Yeah. yeah. And it is, it is exactly this. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a book that was written a long time ago. Well, I guess long time is relative. <laughs> but I think it was written... Um, Maybe in uh, in the in the teens of the last century, by someone named Napoleon Hill. Yeah. It's called Think and Grow Rich. It's about yeah. this thick, oh. and it can all be condensed down to a couple of sentences. If you if you have every fiber of your being devoted to the idea of getting rich, you're going to get rich. It's going to happen, yeah. and and it may seem like magic, but it's just because every part of your mind is on the alert in every moment for the opportunities. Every decision will be made on the basis of let's, let's go towards getting rich rather than the other. And so it really works. And, and so it, it, and there's, there's not just the secret. There's a lot of people who have discovered that motivational seminars, so many motivational seminars are about this. Get clear on what it is you want to do. And if you're clear on what you want to do and why you want to do it, then the whole world is going to get behind you and make it happen. Well, <coughs> what's going to happen is the first thing is every part of your mind is going to get behind making it happen. And then it's going to start recruiting everything and everyone around you. <laughs> so it's true. The whole world will get behind it. But, you know, what it doesn't work is... Very, very often, people think what they want is to get rich. And what they really want is to be happy. Yeah. And they won't get rich. They usually don't get happy either. <laughs> yeah. 
So uh, part of our discussion was I was I was making the argument for, or we were we were discussing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, friendly debate. Taking positions. I would take the position that um, <laughs> that any kind of struggle in meditation. Uh, this is my new mastery over meditation, right? Like, <laughs> so uh, any kind of struggle that you experience is is like a counterproductive and a, a, a wasted effort, and all efforts should go into intention. Now this may sound a lot like the secret. So I'm wondering, is there any is there any place else to put our efforts in meditation? Because you can put intention toward goal setting, toward create, you know cultivating joy. Um, toward all these different things that are like projects, you know, in a healthy meditation practice. But it's really just the intention, isn't it? Or is there something else that we're doing? Well, you see, ultimately, the only thing that happens in the realm of consciousness is that, that leads to anything is intention. So at an ultimate level, this, that's true. You know, it's like, like physically. You know, like I said, you cannot raise your arm, but if you have the intention to, your body's going to go along with it most of the time. Although there's circumstances where it won't, right? And internal struggles that you have are what, what they all are is competing intentions. You have you have different parts of your mind with different intentions. So. If you put your effort into identifying and resolving those conflicts, that is the equivalent of clarifying your attention and setting and holding a, a strong, clear intention. So that's it, really? That's, yeah, at a really fundamental level. Uh, in terms of the only thing psychically that happens, that ever makes anything happen, is that an intention is formed. And what actually does happen, as opposed to what you wish would have happened, depends on the degree to which that intention was supported or not. Yeah, so the degree to which the different compart compartments or board members are aligned. That's right, yeah. yeah. And, and which, one, which of them are more powerful? So if there's a really powerful one, even though there are a few that want to do one thing, if there's one powerful overriding board member, then they will veto. That, that's right. And, and the board member analogy is really good, too. I just like Because <laughs> if, 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 you know, you put something on the table at a meeting and it doesn't go over, there's too much opposition to it, between this meeting and the next meeting, you have the opportunity to bring a lot more information forward make an argument, make your case, persuade people, so on and so forth. And so, yeah, if you, you know, if you have trouble making yourself sit down and meditate on Monday, then before Tuesday comes around, you can do some things. There's not going to be so much resistance to, to re-inspiring yourself as there was to actually sitting down. And so, the next day, when the time comes for the meeting to do to meditate or whatever, yeah, different result. So it does. It comes down to intention. Yes. When when I hear you say uh, different parts of our mind, and that it seems like these different parts can have different intentions, yeah. and then I think, well, that. I'm, I'm guessing, from what I've heard you say other times, is that you're talking about a process mm -hmm. that's going on, and, and the different process is sort of what constitutes these different parts of the mind, or different intentions. But I'm not, I'm not really getting a sense of... I, I, so I guess this, this would be our habits, this would be our the parts of the mind, it would be something, it could be even memories, uh, it could be residue from past experiences. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit more about that? About the parts of the mind? Right. Well, <clears throat> ha 
habits, you mentioned habits, an, an ingrained pattern where if this happens, you react in that way. So we can regard that as a part of the mind. But there's all kinds of other things that we can regard as parts of the mind. Um, and here, let's, we're talking about things that are going on unconsciously. Okay? So a part of your mind could be one that's been working on a particular problem. A problem like, how do I do such and such? Or how do I get this thing in my life that I want? So those mental processes constitute, in some circumstances, a part of the mind. They've been working unconsciously on this, or on this problem and have come to certain kinds of conclusions and formulated certain kinds of, of beliefs about the best way to proceed, all of which will manifest as intention. So when a situation comes up, you could have a part of the mind that is a habit formed through a lot of repetition in the past, previous experiences, and this other part of the mind that has been sorting things out, trying to figure out the best way to achieve this goal. And what arises in consciousness is two completely different sets of, of intentions as to what to do. Now one thing all the parts of your mind generally have in common is they're, they're trying to find happiness and avoid suffering. Mm -hmm. But they have different ideas about how to get there. Your habits will often be in conflict with some part of your, your mind that has realized that doing something different is is a better way to go. Does that, I don't know, does that, that help? Well, that's, that's what, what you described is what I thought of when I heard you say parts of the mind. But then I started thinking, are you talking about a neurological um, process? Are you talking about something that's that's brain related? Well, I, ultimately, everything that happens in the mind has some correlation with what's happening in the brain. Mm -hmm. One of the ways you could divide up the parts of the mind, and this uh, this is the way it was done in the, in the Buddhist tradition, is to divide the mind up according to uh, the senses. And this corresponds to what neural, uh, uh, neuroscience does. You find that the brain is pretty much divided up according to the senses. So you have a visual mind that processes visual information and assigns meaning and significance to it and con conveys it to the other parts of the mind. And you have an auditory mind and, and so forth. In addition to the five senses, there is that part of the mind which doesn't work with sensory information, but it works with thoughts, concepts, ideas, those sorts of things. So you could look at you could look at the mind as having obviously two main parts: the sensory part and the the, the thinking feeling part. And the sensory part has at least five parts to it. Actually, if you look closely, more closely, what we would call the body sense involves a whole lot of other senses. And there's also some other senses that don't get usually included in the five, like the ones that tell you the acceleration and rotation and position and movement of the body. So if you looked at the sensory mind, you'd find it's made up of a bunch of smaller minds, each with their own job to do, which they perform in a, in a lovely way. And then they, they present the results of what they've done to the rest of the mind. The other one here is, the, like I said, the thinking-feeling mind. And it has a lot of different divisions with a lot of different responsibilities. You know, it's got, it's got some division that's responsible for uh, making sure that people think of you what you want to be thought of. Right? And that's exactly the part of mind which will reconstruct yourself in different situations so that it comes across the way it's here. Where is that? Do we know where And you know, if, if you think about it, you'll realize that that one main division 
has a lot of parts, and, and you know, the visual mind doesn't create too many problems. Right? Kate was asking where it is. <laughs> it's, it's between here and here. <laughs> Actually, on a map of the brain, you'll see, uh, for example, with vision, there's a number of different structures within the brain connected to each other that are responsible for doing all of the visual processing. And the same way with the other senses. And there are specific regions of the brain where information from each of these gets together and gets combined. Oh. I bet it's in there, right? What's that? It's all in there, right? It's all in there. All that little mishmash. And all that stuff is going on between your ears. Well. Yeah. Um, at one point during the guided meditation, you said something about uh, being aware of the energy surging within your body, or something to that extent. And, and I found that very interesting, because when I meditate, it's like there's everything is moving. I mean, on the vision, inner, inner, on the end screen, you know, there, there are all these pixelations going on, and, and Shinzen seems to call that flow, and that you can you you can use that as a meditation object, you know, just that 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 feeling in, as he would say. Um, and I, I'm wondering if you could say a little something about that kind of flow. I mean, it's like everything is moving. It's like you're you're just a mass of moving atoms, and it, it sort of feels like that. So it, it, is that, that's probably a physiological phenomenon, isn't it? Like, you're, like the blood surging through your capillaries and everything, creating this sense of this moving thing that you are, even though you're still? Well, I, I, I think it might be a little bit difficult to Try to connect these directly and say that when you feel those, when you feel that those, those vibrations, when you feel that effervescence in your body, that 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 is that what you're sensing is the flow of blood through your blood vessels and things like that. I, but it's a really good metaphor. There's a lot of things going on in your in your body and your mind constantly. I mentioned that in the meditation because I had you, I, I had asked you to become very aware of your body and very aware of your mind at the same time. And I have found in myself and more, and a tremendous number of people, that it's when you, when that combination happens and when, when there's a lot of clarity when you're totally with it, when it happens, you experience that that energy, that vibration. And I call that PT. I call that one of the the, the physical concomitants of a particular mental state that arises. And if you if you pursue that a little further, it becomes joy and happiness. And so that's why I mentioned it. Mm -hmm. On uh, what it, you know, to try to translate that experience and account for it in terms of our ordinary physical description of the universe and physiology, um, nobody, including myself, I think, is in a position to do that. But where I think the answer is going to be found is it's going to be found in things that happen in the brain. Okay? Um, there is a whole strip of cortex on each side of your, your brain that is directly, very directly, two neurons directly connected to sensations in your body. And, and, and then the information goes from there to other places. If you take the top off of somebody's head, I don't know how many of you do that very often. <laughs> you take the top off of somebody's head and you stimulate in that area. They will feel difficult to describe vibratory energetic sensations in the part of the body that corresponds to that. So when somebody's in meditation, 
and they have a strong PT experience. I wouldn't be at all surprised. My speculation is what you could find if you could examine what's happening in the brain is that there is a lot of there's a lot of electrical activity taking place in that part of the cortex of the brain. So you subjectively have the feeling that you described, talked about. In other words, whether or not anything's actually happening in the body that's directly related to that feeling, I don't know, but it seems to me more likely where something is happening physiologically is in the brain. And in general, the circumstance you find that is, in, is when attention becomes very stable, very focused, when there is an ample amount of awareness present, and we have the experience of, quote, energy arising. And I think that, that it is a kind of neurological activity that when it reaches a certain intensity, it starts to spill over into other parts of the brain, and we have those sensations. Because all of those sensations ultimately mean nothing, and they pass away. They arise corresponding to certain meditative states. And if you ignore them and keep practicing, they disappear. And you, move, you actually move on to a much more refined meditative state. So, for what it's worth, that's my speculation as to what is going on there. I, I don't know whether I'm getting too physiological for anyone here. No. <laughs> something about the senses and which parts of the brain you start by saying the eyes they don't cause you too much trouble you said because they're they're focused and they have a job and it's pretty clear and as though you were going to go on talk about the other senses which perhaps were not so straightforward no it wasn't the other senses it's that that other that other main part of the brain which is the thinking feeling part okay. that, that, that's the part that most of the time when we're talking about all the different parts of the mind, it's all the different parts of that thinking, feeling mind. That, and, and they're the ones that are in disagreement as to how best to achieve the ultimate goal of... In boredom. Yeah. <laughs> yes? So, is it maybe good to think of these different phenomena that occur as just kind of tools, maybe, that can be helpful sometimes, but... I mean, I would get this thing, you know, where I was meditating and I would, everything would slow down, like, really slow down, like I was hanging in time. And, like, I kind of attached that feeling because it felt really good. And I was like, wow, I'm doing something, you know. <laughs> I've stopped time. And, uh, so I would try and get that to happen. And the more I tried, the less it was. And if I didn't try, it would kind of happen still once in a while. But, you know. good because it kind of gave me a sense of something, but to sit there and try and make it happen really wasn't that useful. Yes, that, that is exactly true. A lot of these things can be used and have been incorporated into various techniques that are used in different meditation traditions. Right. Uh, but what is not useful is getting attached to them and trying to make them happen, pursuing them. You know, and this this happens. And I'll have people in meditation reports saying, "Well, I just can't get deep." And I'm saying, "Well, forget about getting deep. Do this and do this." <laughs> <laughs> and if you have that experience that you call getting deep, well, that's fine. You know, just enjoy it while it lasts. But it's not about having particular kinds of experiences. 
but they can be used, like the, the PT that I talked about, which the way I was trained was you ignore it, and then you ignore it, and you ignore it some more until it goes away. And that's it. Since then, I've discovered it can be used. You can use the PT to enter a kind of light jhana. Jhanas are absorptions. And you can use PT to enter light jhanas, and if you use PT to enter light jhanas, you can, doing that practice will greatly increase the, the, your, your concentration, your attentional stability. So you can actually use those to do a kind of practice that's going to ac accelerate the process. But chasing them for them for their own sake, just experiencing because, oh, this, wow, this is really different. You know, I love this strange feeling of all this energy moving <laughs> into my skin. A after a while, it gets boring. <laughs> But you can't use it. It makes it, it is sufficiently captivating that it makes a suitable object that you can enter what I call a flow state using uh, psychologist Chiksen Mihaly's definition of flow. Flow is exactly what jhana is in meditation. Uh, it, it's a state where um, you become completely absorbed in a particular activity. It becomes effortless. Uh, all sense of self, all awareness of concern with everything else just disappears. We've all experienced it. You experience it every time you do something you absolutely love. Occasionally it happens in good sex. Things like that. So we all, we've all had those experiences. You can enter into that in meditation, into that flow state in meditation. And it's called jhana. And you can use PT because it it's really easy to get real focus on it. You can use PT to enter like jhanas. And if you spend time practicing like jhanas, you will greatly enhance the power of your concentration. So that's, that's an example of how these things can be, be used. And my background in training is an example of how, although there's, some people have discovered how to use them, there's other traditions where they were never appreciated. And like I say, I was taught to ignore it, and then ignore it, and then ignore it, until it goes away. And the, the physical pliancy that they say you get, which means that the physical pliancy? The physical pliancy, Which yeah. means that you're much, Yeah. I imagine you're much more able to meditate comfortably and relax yeah. posture. That, of course, that is actually, that must be a physio physiological Reaction. Yes, it, it must be. Yes, but that's not pity. That's a that's the, that's another stage that you get to. Uh, yeah, it's. Is that right? Yeah. It, yes, it, it it's something separate. It's uh, the physical pliancy is where part of PT is that you cease to experience uh, ordinary sensations in an ordinary. And so that's true of your body as well. And so what happens in connection with PT, but technically it's a different thing from PT, is that you know, as you sit for a long period of time, you know, there's places that start to ache and there's other places that, that start to get a pressure burn and, and so on and so forth, right? That doesn't happen anymore. Your you your body feels just delightfully pleasant and, and still. And ordinary sensations, you know, if you want them, you can find them. You could direct your attention towards the feeling of, of your, your ankle on the floor. But if you don't intentionally do that, you just have this very, very lovely, perfect physical stillness, very sublime kind of pleasantness. And it allows you to sit for very long periods of time. And it, it, there is something, now all of that could be entirely psychological. That just somehow psychologically you shut out that kind of sensory input so it doesn't hurt anymore. But there's other thing that comes with physical pliancy, which suggests that there's something more physiological going on, is if you sit for a long time before you develop physical pliancy, you'll go to stand up and one foot's fallen asleep and one leg's so stiff that it's hard to move and things like that. You know. 
And when you have physical buoyancy, that doesn't happen. When you get when you get ready to get up, you feel great. Nothing's falling asleep. No nerves have been pinched. So there is something physiological in connection.